Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Electricity, or the lack of it, will continue to grab headlines in South Africa in 2022. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the outlook for the sector. Hi Terence. Hi Sunil. Last year was another troubling one for ESCOM and electricity consumers. Yes, you know, more than a decade into our electricity crisis, we had our worst ever load shedding year. And the prognosis going forward remains quite bleak in terms of the system uh, supply demand dy dynamics, and mostly because Eskom's ageing coal fleet without Madupi and Cassilia over 40 years old has been run too hard for too long, has been badly maintained as a, and is now unreliable, volatile, and uh, I think that the risk therefore remains for load shedding in 2022 until they get the energy availability factor up. And whether that is possible is also not clear. Um, so that's a, that was a big uh, downer for South Africa, for the economy, uh, during a period where we had many other headwinds uh, ranging from the sort of response to COVID and the Im impacts of that. It should have been a, a recovery year, full recovery year, but we had this uh, uh, load shedding on top of the July incidents, which really were a drag on the economy. Um, and then we obviously had the sharp tariff increases uh, at the beginning of last year. Again, holding tariffs far too low for far too long and badly administered by uh, NURSA, the regulator, which is losing court case after court case uh, for to Eskom, and that is having an impact ultimately in the tariff. And we have another tariff decision looming very soon uh, so for 2022, so that's another risk. And then th obviously trying to get some new supply into the system. There was supposed to be an emergency uh, procurement process, which has all but stalled, mostly because the design of the risk mitigation program is actually irrational and very, very costly. Um, it also involves technologies that, uh, are, that needed to cross certain environmental hurdles and, and didn't and failed to do so, the power ships in particular. So they, that's also stalled. So in any immediate relief that was hoped for in 2021, you know, if, um, it came to nothing. So a really difficult year, 2021, in the electricity space. What are the current issues facing ESCOM? Well, they remain <coughs> the financially. Uh, the, uh, the utility is not sustainable. Its debt uh, remains out of a, a level or beyond a level that it can pay off through normal uh, you know, business operations. So the financially, uh, that hasn't been dealt with. That's another big risk to the uh, electricity supply industry. We've got this sort of drip feeding approach, although it's big numbers, but it's, it's not dealing decisively with the debt issue from the National Treasury. And there has been no movement uh, although there's been lots of talk on dealing with uh, the debt crisis at Eskom. Operationally, as I said, the energy availability factor from the coal fleet remains dismal and is falling. The maintenance program hasn't been able to claw back uh, these years of neglect, and it's going to take some time. Um, and I think Eskom was overly ambitious in terms of getting uh, the reliability back into that coal fleet. They've also got a a very a wide spectrum of plant and uh, maybe trying to keep all this plant operating rather than focusing on a few big plants and getting that back up and running. That's what some of the, um, the discussion currently underway, whether they should just let some of these units go and certain of the power stations go quicker and then focus on a few of the bigger ticket power stations. So the maintenance and operationally things are still very, very challenging at Eskom. And then there's also th all this hap happening at a time when they need to clean up after years of state capture, after years of corruption, and there's a lot of work that is having to be done at, at, that, at Eskom operationally, financially, and restructuring of the utility, which is a vertically integrated monopoly into three um, self-standing divisions under Eskom Holding. You know, this is a big uh, restructuring task while you've got these operation problems, financial burden, and this uh, cleanup that you have to do from the years of corruption. Is the policy environment supportive of resolving these issues? That's, that's a mixed picture there. <coughs> uh, the, 
Eventually, the integrated resource plan was approved in late 2019. It was immediately out of date, clearly out of date. Um, and, uh, but directionally, it is mostly correct, you know, much more renewables in, into the system, uh, although it keeps sustaining very artificial limits on yearly build at uh, 1,000 megawatts for solar PV, 1,600 megawatts for wind. Those are artificial limits and it should be uh, lifted because th these are the cheapest technologies uh, that we can introduce and the quickest that we can introduce. So directionally, mostly it's there, but it still holds on to uh, some coal projects that are probably never going to be built, mostly because they're not economic. And it's very, very difficult to finance coal projects in this decarbonizing world. So that's a distraction. It's, we, it's still an enabler of this risk mitigation program, which is totally irrational and very, very expensive. Uh, and that we should have moved on from that and not be caught up in this distraction. But it looks like we're going to hold on to that. So that's another policy overhang that we're not going to get rid of. And then we've got um, to make some decisions around the mix around whether gas to power, imported gas is important, where, whether there are dom domestic gas resources. There's a lot of resistance to exploration and development, as we see in the wild coast at the moment. So policy environment, although generally the direction is for a lot more renewables in the system, there's still sort of a, 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 a holding on to some of the legacies around coal. And there's a bit of a, 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 a you know, uh, insistence on moving ahead uh, with uh, certain technologies that probably have a fairly short lifespan in a decarbonizing world. And of course, there's that, uh, there's, there is scope to uh, extend the lifespan of Kuburg, and I think work should happen this year on that. But that is a risk that I didn't mention earlier to Eskom, whether that program is going to stay uh, in time and on budget. And then I think overall we have this schizo or bipolar type disorder in the political economy surrounding uh, electricity, but energy more generally. We've got the president very much uh, tie hitching his wagon to the energy transition, talking about renewables, uh, uh, talking about green hydrogen. And we've got an energy minister who's <laughs> very much hankering after clean coal, which has never been proven anywhere in the world and uh, domestic gas, which is also not available in the system. So it it's really sends out a, a, a strange mixed messages to investors. So no, the policy environment, although is partly supportive, the political economy is really not. Are there any signs of hope for the sector in 2022? Yes, a few signs definitely emerged in uh, 2021. One, the restarting of the Renewable Energy Procurement Program and the huge appetite around that. I think there is some concern about how concentrated it is around some large players. And there are calls for, you know, because technology costs have come down so aggressively, there are suggestions that maybe that um, there shouldn't be these government guarantees backing these renewables projects. But I think without them, you're not going to see those low tariffs. Uh, there's also concern about how much South African involvement there is how much South African content there is. So there's a lot of issues and, uh, um, confronting that, but at least we got that over the line. We now need to get those projects to financial close and shovels in the ground, um, because that has been our most successful procurement program. But we also had this 100 megawatt uh, reform, which allows in, uh, distributed generation plants, self-generation plants really for big industrial and mining customers to proceed without a license and for that, uh, some of those, uh, that electricity not to be used for self-use, but also to be sold to third parties, which is very important. Uh, we now have to stress test that. Uh, is the NURSA registration system going to be a quasi-licensing, or is it going to really facilitate accelerated investment? Can, it, can the decision by Eskom to release 36,000 hectares of Mpumalanga land for these projects um, in a grid-rich territory uh, where these coal-fired power stations have traditionally been, where some are decommissioning, formally being decommissioned this year, Komati, 
informally many are decommissioning themselves so the grid capacity is becoming available this isn't the best renewables resource land in the country we know that that's more in the, the Cape provinces but this is where the transmission capacity is available so that can really help consolidate that reform and get private uh, money into uh, building much needed energy capacity um, as we see we need energy as much as we need capacity in the system you know the fact that we are load shedding over weekends to replenish diesel and pump storage reserves shows that there's a lack of uh, energy in the system never mind capacity so we need to get that moving and that that was a big highlight of last year and a reform that could go some way uh, to changing uh, the the supply demand balance uh, in the not too distant future as private money goes in private skills private um, ingenuity um, and but it'll be interesting to see what impact it has on the, the the renewable procurement program the government one which has so much uh, sort of burdensome aspects to it where the IPPs are not going to shift their attention more and more to this 100 megawatt opportunity and the appetite therefore for future bid rounds might be affected so we're going to have to watch that closely and they might they might need to be much more nimble at the IPP office. Unfortunately, the IPP office and the DMRE have shown no num nimbleness around the risk mitigation program. So uh, we will we'll wait and see whether they can be more nimble around the renewable energy IPP program. And then of course, COP26, our good offer around our NDC triggered an offer of $8.5 billion, which we now have to turn into a transaction. So there's this offer uh, it's, it's unclear, the division between loans and grants. Obviously, it's mostly going to be loans, but how we can leverage that offer to, to stimulate, uh, one, the energy transition that's needed and the investment that's needed, but more importantly, to start using uh, that cheaper money, hopefully, to, uh, s to drive a just transition in Mpumalanga, where there's a lot of vulnerable workers, businesses, and communities because these are many of these people and communities are tired and businesses are tired to coal. Coal is not going to go away immediately but as the plants are decommissioned there's going to be an impact on the coal industry. So this is an important template not only for South Africa can we do just transition in South Africa but for potentially for the world. So there are those few elements of, of hope that arose in 2021 and we need to consolidate those and accelerate the implementation in 2022. What work should be done this year to begin addressing this crisis once and for all? Well, I think on the Eskom front, the debt issue has to be dealt with. Uh, without dealing with the debt issue, the whole restructuring uh, into those three divisions is not going to work as it should because those divisions need to be unencumbered to be able to, as the transmission system operator especially needs to be in a way that a uh, position to do the investments and not be encumbered by debt overhang that doesn't allow it to do the good investments that are needed. The uh, generation division where most of the debt will reside also needs to find a way of navigating its future as does the distribution uh, business. So we need that debt solution and it's urgent. We have to get this maintenance sorted out, get the what remaining plants uh, units uh, that can be salvaged, need to be salvaged and run at an energy availability factor much higher levels than what we currently see. And then there's obviously the Kuburg uh, steam generator investment that is already running late, it seems, but is, is a number of years late. And that needs to all be done by ESKIM. Um, and then on the policy front, we really need a, uh, the integrated uh, resource plan to be overhauled um, and updated. <coughs> more updated than overall. I think we just need to needs to reflect the real technology costs that needs to take away artificial limits and really have as a, a, a clear picture for investors as to where South Africa is going and a commitment to continually update that that plan so that we, do, we don't sit here now saying well it's out of date and well, what will this investment really take place? Will we really have this much gas in the system? Will we really have an Inga power in the system where we really have coal in the system by 2030, actually have a regular updating of this plan 
try and depoliticize it as much as possible. It will never be possible to totally depoliticize it, but to, to try as, po as much as possible. And then to have a joined up energy vision, we need to start really working on the integrated energy plan uh, for South Africa that takes all the energy services of lighting, heating, cooling, mobility, and has this bigger picture of where electricity is going to play the most bigger space, where green hydrogen is going to play a role, uh, how we're going to electrify our mobility in particular. South Africa is a big in, um, investor in automotive production. All our cars that we produce, except for there's some marginal activity happening on hybrids, but really is um, internal combustion engine. Do we want to sustain this industry? It's a debate we should have. If we do, it needs to move towards battery electric vehicles and potentially fuel cell vehicles. And uh, where, where, where is that mix? It looks like battery electric vehicles are already gaining huge traction around the world. Fuel cell electric vehicles will also have a role, especially at the heavy duty end. And where, where are we going to play as South Africa? And I think we really need that bigger picture. As more and more services get electrified using green electricity, South Africa is in a good position to do that, given its solar and wind resources. Um, and then there's obviously this clamor for green hydrogen. We need this bigger picture that we can all get behind. It's a massive opportunity for South Africa. So I think the integrated, uh, other than the Eskom issues, the integrated resource plan update, and then getting our joined up vision around an energy plan for South Africa, it's going to really have big implications for industrial policy, economic policy, if we really get our heads around it and have a line of march that's aligned to the energy transition, aligned to the world that's decarbonizing rapidly and wants to accelerate that decarbonization and uh, a world that also needs many of the things that South Africa pr can produce, both hard minerals, which uh, the energy transition is very hard min minerals intensive, as well as this new commodity of green hydrogen. So there's a big opportunity to use this year to consolidate our vision as South Africa. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.